So the way we're going to have this conversation is I'm going to come into it from a five head space. I think it's really important that I do that just for my work, for my audience, because ultimately, even though I know people who aren't in my audience are going to come in here and have very strong opinions, it's important for my audience to know what perspective I'm coming from. So I'm going to have this from like a five head space. If you guys are unaware of my level system, links down below to watch a two hour video on it. Yes, it's a two hour video, but I have my own philosophy system about introspection, extrospection, and I it's all based around perception. And I think when we're talking about these issues that are very, very sensitive. It's especially about perception. So we're gonna talk about whether or not Ethan Klein properly perceives Hassan and his support for this Yemeni, is Yemeni the right term, guys? Yemen soldier as him supporting terrorism. So the premise of this video is in reaction to what we went over on stream last night, which members can check out, Ethan Klein, basically calling out Twitch and Hassan because he says that he supports a terrorist. And I think that's sort of interesting. Like I said, between last night's stream and this stream, there was like 10 more videos I wanted to watch on the subject matter. But right now, here's what I've gathered and here's sort of the conclusion that I'm coming to now that I've seen as much as I've seen. And I'm going to share it with you guys. I do think Ethan is misperceiving Hassan. But I think Hassan is also misperceiving from his perspective what he thinks he's supporting. Obviously, I'm open to being wrong as well. So you guys can always correct me in the comments. Here's this initial part we're going to start with. Here he is. Now here, this is from a story. This is from the interview Hassan did with him. At the time, I have to admit, this interview blew my mind. Ethan is reading off a script he gave himself right now. Mine. I, I thought that this would be a bridge too far and that Twitch would step in and do something. He's interviewing a terrorist. And it's not that he's interviewing a terrorist because I've seen Hassan try to deflect just saying, oh, CNN reached me, BBC reached me, they want to talk to him, therefore it's real journalism. Hassan did not ask him one critical question. In fact, the opposite, it was a complete puff piece where he sucked him off, elevated him, was uncritical. And even in the moments of absolutely much time uh, with insane statements like this, um, he essentially covers for him uh, and acts like uh, ignorant. Chinese people, but one of the captains, <laughs> the captain was Chinese and he did caught with them and he uh, uh, danced some music with them and he was vibing. So he, 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 he likes him. Yeah. <laughs> so what, I mean, what? It... <laughs> yes, he just admit to being a, a terrorist who's hanging out with hostages. That That's literally just what happened. And it's... So for those of you who are just coming in, we watched h3 stream from last night this is last night's stream we didn't finish it we got many hours in but now that i've had time to sleep and kind of watch a bunch of stuff to put together for you i'm going to kind of explain why hassan is wrong but ethan is wrong about hassan being wrong so ethan is saying that this is a part of the proof that hassan is supporting a terrorist the terrorist being this yemeni soldier here in this top left corner we're going to refer to him as like the Yemeni soldier, because I don't know what his name is, but Hassan is interviewing this kid with a translator. They're laughing together. This is a young guy. Hassan sees him as like a rebel fighter, a freedom fighter, somebody who's standing up against oppression, somebody who's standing up against the West, someone who's standing up against Israel and colonizers. Like Hassan is processing this person as a young 19-year-old kid who grew up in a bubble that's basically been um, had the boot of America or the boot of Western colonization on his neck his whole life. And as a reaction to that, he basically makes it difficult along with these pirates for ships to move in and out. And so he thinks they're like hitting him where it hurts the most, the West. Okay. So Ethan is calling this kid a terrorist because he's hanging out with the Houthis who BBC and other organizations have called like terrorists. And we discussed it yesterday on stream. Like terrorist in that word, look, a terrorist is just the label you throw on people that you want to paint in a negative light, or it's a person that's causing havoc for a reason they deem acceptable. Terrorism is an interesting word because it, it doesn't always, like, it, it's a political term used to paint a picture. And when you hear that word, you have like instant fear, like, oh my God, a terrorist. But you could also have a similar fear when you hear the word terrorist to hearing the word cop. And it's all about perception because when you're being terrorized by somebody, 
that is what feels like the terrorist. And then there's, of course, like layers to the word terrorist. So let's just be very open minded with the fact that I don't want any debate bros to come into my comment sections because this isn't about you pretending you know anything. We're all a bunch of entertainers on the Internet. We're just trying to figure out the world. Hassan is not an expert. Ethan's not an expert. I'm not an expert. OK, I just want to make that clear. Some people believe if you support America, you support terrorism. Right. In this case, Ethan is making the argument that if you support the Houthis, then you support um, terrorism. And I would argue both perceptions are correct in different ways. And I'm going to explain why. OK, Tom knows it. That's why he's laughing a lot and trying to deflect. That's so crazy. Yes, it is. Are they just chilling with the captains? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> you don't so understand? Why would... Do you think anyone would just get access to hang out with, like, these hostages? Why would he be hanging out with hostages? I don't know. But Hassan does a good way of um, deflecting it and being like, oh, no, this is just funny, silly stuff. You know what I mean? Um, awesome. Moving on to the next part. Okay. No, I'm moving on to the next part. Thank you, Ethan. Next part. This is the next part Hassan or Ethan featured of Hassan talking to the Yemeni soldier. Okay, this is a stupid question. Okay, you can preface it with that. Does he wa does he know what one piece is? I will see but like in a mumkin has a so Ali Kun Shwai Ahbal Bas this Alak Taraf Shuhu a one piece, I'm back smack be one piece. Okay, the any mother to hold on a shahad one piece Lofi. Lofi? Yeah, he said he's he's been watching it since he was a kid. <laughs> no way! Yeah. That's sick. Yes, yes, that's fire. That's so fire. Oh my god. We think the Houthis on Allah is doing uh, what Luffy would do. You should. Okay, I just need to say this is a One Piece fan. He said, We think Houthis are doing what Luffy is doing. I need to make this abundantly clear. Hassan has zero understanding of Luffy as a character. I'm almost questioning if he watches One Piece. Just based off the sentence alone, I would say you've never seen an episode of One Piece, right? Like, just to be clear, Luffy does not give a fuck about your politics. Luffy would never be a freedom fighter. Luffy does not care about your politics. Luffy does not care about your label. He doesn't care if you're a pirate or marine. He is never going to fight in your war. Luffy does not care about you. Luffy cares about meat and being the king of pirates. Okay? Like, he does not care about that. He only does what makes sense within his values. Luffy is an island. He's not part of your community. He doesn't want to be your friend. Okay? Like, <laughs> okay? So, let me explain why Hassan is wrong about who this Yemeni soldier is, but I'll tell you who he is in the story. So I, this is so exciting for me because I do love my stories. We are all someone in a story, right? I think Hassan is wrong that this Houthi is Luffy. He's probably more akin to different pirate groups, but it's not Luffy's, right? So I'll get into it in a second. Tell him that. So this is a meme he's saying, the Houthi pirates are like Luffy. Luffy, of course, is this irreverent, uh, fun-loving, happy, lovable character who just wants to experience freedom on the high seas. Um, uh, and it appeals to youth, appeals to young people. And Hassan is working overtime to convince people that this child, who is a terrorist, not child, he's, a t he's like 20, um, this kid who's a terrorist <laughs> is just like Luffy. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I've only seen halfway through One Piece, so I don't know. But I don't remember um, Luffy flying this Jolly Roger. Death to America, death to Israel, cursed to the Jews. That was not on his uh, Jolly Roger. But once again, there's time. There's time for it to change. Apparently, there's a big tone change in the second half. Um, <laughs> okay, relax. Okay, we're done there. Thank you, Ethan. Okay. Now, one of the controversies was the conversation that he had with Nick, Hassan had with Nick. Ethan featured a part of it, but there's actually a different part of it that I want to feature. And Nick had some weird feelings about this moment. So last night on stream, we weren't sure if Hassan was joking about being excited for the Houthis basically flying helicopters onto boats and stopping... Um, shipments from going through we weren't sure if Hassan was making a joke or kind of making light of the fact that you know he's kind of celebrating the Houthis the way that Americans do soldiers and it was like a little confusing so for context after watching this interview I've come to the conclusion that Hassan is not joking 
that Hassan does love the Houthis and that he does look at them as freedom fighters, but not terrorists. And all freedom fighters are dubbed like terrorists from the opposite side. It's very common. But I want to explain what what freedom fighter group I think he most thinks they are and who Hassan is in the story and who these freedom fighters are in the story. And I'm going to explain to you why Hassan's wrong, but from a five perspective, because if we get into the two perspective, like nobody has time for that girl. So let's talk about this from the five perspective, because this is so human, right? So Hassan is wrong, but not for the reason Ethan thinks Ethan and, and two bubbles. They think Hassan loves them because they're terrorists. They don't understand like the difference between a freedom fighter, a Luffy, a terrorist and a terrorist again, such a political term, but these are different categories of people, right? They are different. So let's watch this clip here. So you get an idea of why I'm coming to my conclusions. Well, they're doing this for Bro, this is like multi-layered and extremely complicated. And I'm kind it's of actually not. It's very black and white when you. So he's explaining Israel and Palestine and Nick goes, man, this is very complicated and layered. And Hassan goes, actually, it's not. It's very black and white it's showing us where his bubble is, where his limited thinking is like it is very complicated and it is very nuanced because it's about humanity. It's not about Israel and Palestine. Israel and Palestine represents so much of what humanity is. Ethan and Hassan can't make friends. They can't get along. I can't get two loser YouTubers to get along together. And you think Israel and Palestine is going to be solved? It's a very complicated issue that isn't complicated because people don't know what to do. It's complicated because people are being untruthful about their intentions. They are being untruthful that they do want to wipe out Palestinians or untruthful that they do want to wipe out Israelis or untruthful that there is money involved or there just there's so much not truth happening, right? Like there's so much lies happening but it's happening from everybody and honestly the idea that you can trust either side is hilarious to me i love you all so much please i please okay i don't even trust the neighbor at the gas station to tell me the truth about things when people be lying every day and you want to trust these foreign governments to tell you what their real intentions are please now listen to how hassan has the conversation he's so excited like a boy at a candy store he's so excited I can't wait. I'm going to you are going to laugh when I tell you who I think he is in the story. It is so much funnier now that I think of it. It's so funny. OK, here we go. Bro, this is like multi-layered and extremely complicated. And I'm kind of actually scared. not. It's very black and white when you think about it. But like, obviously, I'm, I'm so, trying to give I'm you so as confused. much. I'm trying to give you as much information as possible on the back end so that you at least are. So a Kanye, bit... Kanye was wrong then. Kanye is still wrong. Yes. Um, If I explain to. Uh, if I explain to this man, Israelis come extraction brigade, his mind will explode. Israel has a unit. What did you just say? Israel has a unit that harvests the sperm of the soldiers in case of their untimely demise. This is called the goon platoon. That's what I like to call it. Dude, what is That's going right. on? It seems weird, right? It's, this is what happens when you, much like the Nazis, in an identical capacity, have this insane religious and ethnic superiority complex and want to build an ethno state. This is the type of weird that you engage in called eugenics. I know about that. Wait, so what about their sperm? They, they take the sperm from the sack when they die? She thinks it's just another rocket attack. I, I repeat, this is not a joke. This is the Israeli state itself posted this video. But a gripping fear prickles through Shiley's entire body and it's outside their bedroom window. Her husband, Yahav, fights the danger as Shaili runs, leaving everything behind to protect their baby, Shaya. She clings to hope that she won't need to raise their newborn alone. Four days later, her heart shatters. She hugs Shaya tightly and knows she must fulfill Yahav's dream to create more life. So, Shaili puts out a call for the unthinkable, to retrieve his seed and be able to continue growing their family. She's in her own war against time, and the crowd leaps into action to complete her desperate mission. But it's too late. Shiley did everything she could to save her family. We still have time to save ours. Yeah. So I, I don't understand. Home extraction. They put it, they shove a cattle prod up the butt of the deceased. Or I think they, I guess they take it directly from the ball sack if they have the opportunity to do so. They have limited of a, time. Of like a dead soldier? Yeah. So the, Don't ask me why they don't just nut in a cup beforehand. I don't know why they don't just do that. I feel like that's a way more efficient process if you really, really, really need to ensure that you're... Is Israel put this on the internet? Yeah. And they thought this was okay? Yeah, and they did it in English. When Israel when Israel does propaganda in English, know that it's actually intended for the American and the Western audience. Wow, why, why would this make them look good? They're insane, dog. That's it. <laughs> okay. Like it's like it's the same Nazis. Like they were insane, and they did a lot of insane. Sh and when you look at it in hindsight, you're like, why the f did they think this was appropriate? I don't know. Okay, so 
Hassan is like dumbing down this conversation because Nick doesn't know anything, which is like fair from that perspective. But I just want to make it very clear that Hassan is also letting us know what bubble he's in and which side he's on. And though there's nuance in Hassan's positioning, he's also like, I think wrong about who he's identifying as purely like the right person. And I would say Hassan is running into the same dilemma Christian Americans run into where they whitewash and justify Christopher Columbus's actions on Native Americans. I actually think he's doing that with Muslim communities and specifically like political Muslim communities. And I think that he does that because he's closer to them and identifies with them in the same way that like Christians would do the same thing. That's my observation. I think he isn't actually like some, like, I think he's picking his tribe and sticking to it, which I think is like incredibly reasonable. That's how most people do things. I just think it is a two decision. So two bubbles versus five bubbles. And I'm trying to explain it from a five perspective. I don't expect Hassan not to be a two. He is a two. So he's picking his bubble and he's fighting for that side, but it's not, he's not like an extremist, like bin Laden character. He's a freedom fighter character. And I need you to understand who that is in the story. And I'll get to it in a second. But he's like in in two different positions. He's not quite a freedom fighter. He's not going to fucking Palestine to help fight them, right? Other Americans are doing it, but he's not doing it, okay? So he's not that guy. He's the other guy. And I'll get into that in a second. But let's finish this out, and then I'll explain to you who I think everybody is in this story. Oh, like... Oh, my God. And they have power, and they're crazy. Um. Oh, here's a, you a are really famous prominent my example. This man right here from, I believe, Brooklyn or Long Island is a fantastic example of how the settler process works. This is in East Jerusalem, which is occupied is uh, occupied by Israel, but there are a lot of historic Palestinian homes there. This is one of those historic Palestinian homes. Jacob flew in from Long Island um, to East Jerusalem and basically took over someone's house, literally. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, is allowed to steal it, Yami. This guy? Yeah. This guy definitely has a right to account. Oh, yeah. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you, It's you, easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. You are stealing my house. So he just came from America to steal someone's house? Yeah. They do it all the time. I mean, did he get the house? Um, I think they did. I think he did, yeah. You're kidding. Yeah, they, they've been doing- Now, this is a phenomenon that happens in the United States currently. Like, this idea, like, you're safe, you bought your house, you're only as safe until people want to take it. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of the irony of all of this. It just happens differently and in different ways. And this is the problem is like when you don't have this personal lived experience, it either lends you to never believing that it happens to other people or when you do have this experience, it could also traumatize you beyond recovery, right? So there's something to keep in mind here. Again, we're coming from like that five perspective of accepting that humans are on a journey and there's like they're these evolved animals who do things and whether or not they're evoking their free will is always questionable to me. Like we argue that we're so smart and so resilient and so wise, but like you can't stop people that aren't your wife so i don't know how smart and wise you really are bitch. so there's always like this question of like oh like how how fr how much free will are people really evoking if any like how much do they really think about these things and how do they think about these things and keep in mind where hassan is coming from ultimately he is a muslim born person from turkey who came to the united states but that is his background versus my parents are iraqi born people who were catholic christians assyrians who immigrated to the united states one always backs the Christian narrative and one always backs the Muslim narrative, but they are at the end of the day, like two sides of the same coin. He whitewashes the Ottoman empire. My parents whitewash Christopher Columbus. You know, it is what it is. Okay. People, people ultimately pick their sides. They pick their bubbles because it's where they feel most at home. And this is a part of that narrative, right? Like Hassan is picking a side he thinks is most just. And I think that that could make a lot of sense if, you were born Hassan. In the same way he says, if you were born Palestinian, you'd be pro-Palestinian. I think if you're Hassan, you would have been Hassan as well. Right? Doing this nonstop. So they take somebody else's house. Yeah. Yeah. And the military comes in and kicks them out. But kicks out the, the owners of the house. Yeah. Bro, yeah. bro, I'm not gonna lie. This, okay. this is depressing as If hell. you were to, like, for example, sometimes in the media, they'll be like, an anti-Semitic incident occurred in a, um, in a Jewish community center the other day, the other week, where... Uh, anti-Semitic protesters attacked Jewish people that were quietly uh, congregating. And then you look into it, and you look into the incident, and it turns out it's actually an auction. An auction for what, you might ask? An auction for houses. Houses where? Houses in the West Bank that Palestinians are occupying. 
in the United States of America, we have auctions for real estate of homes that do not belong to the people that are selling them. And, and I just want to remind you guys, like, it's hard for us to accept what we've done to each other and what we've done to justify those actions. But like a lot of the children that you are adopting are kidnapped children or taken children from families who didn't know they would ever see them again. Like, I know that's really hard to process, but so many of the children that these white Americans go to foreign countries to quote adopt to save them aren't being saved from families who don't want them. They're being like saved from families who can't pay for them because of the impact the colonization has done to their countries. Like, this isn't, you know, nothing happens outside. Nothing happens in a bubble, even though it's all happening in a bubble. Like we are all impacting each other in different ways. And this is why I say the more, this is, I think, why studies kind of show the more progressive you are or the more educated you are, you tend not to have children or you tend to be more aware of these decisions you're making because, you know, it, it's much, how do I say this? Sometimes the truth is just too much to handle. And I think it takes a very resilient person to handle it. And the truth comes in layers. Like that truth comes from in many, many different layers. And so it's really scary for us to realize how many layers. Like Hassan is telling partially the truth. Ethan is telling partially the truth. I'm telling partially the truth. But we don't have all of the facts to tell the full truth. And so we're going to struggle with sort of knowing where does our understanding of the truth, you know, start and end. But we don't have all of the information. We just don't. And there's no one innocent on this planet. We all impact each other in some harmful way. So the goal is never to be perfect. It's just to harm reduce. So Hassan thinks this is the best way to harm reduce. And Ethan thinks this is the best way to harm reduce. And there is the conflict of all of us. We all want to harm reduce. If you asked every person on the street, like, who do you think we should protect? They say innocent people. But then they'll say something really horrific about those innocent people. Like they deserve to die because they're in the streets praising their side for winning. At the end of the day, we're all in disagreement about one, who should win? What is objective truth? And what does, you know, what's the best solution for all of our problems? And the question, like the, the reality is, is like there, there isn't some universal solution, but people aren't willing to accept that. That's why they keep fighting. They keep like making these YouTube videos where they pretend they have this like totally objective understanding of what we should do next, right? When people go and protest those auctions, the American media says anti-Semitism. Oh my God. It's all just fried, dude. How, how do you, how do you like read this stuff all day and like not like cry yourself to sleep at night? This is horrible. I'm, I'm motivated by the change that I might, I'm motivated by the change that I might actually create in this world. Okay. Hassan is obsessed with this subject matter. It's all he consumes. And I think that's why he's so prejudiced and biased. Because that's what happens. If I guarantee you, if all you consume is pro-Israeli content for long enough, you'll be anti-Palestine. If you consume pro-Palestinian content, you'll be anti-Israel. If you consume enough of a particular bubble, you will become susceptible. This is literally, they've done studies on this. It's why like the doom scroll is such a feeling. You don't do it. It's not, it's not logical or rational. And I do think that Hassan spends too much time focusing on this one subject. I think I'm not sure. He's already said he has trouble socializing outside of stream. He's basically becoming Asman. You know how Asman said he realized the last two years he's become an asshole because streaming became his whole life. So he's going to take a break. Hassan needs to do it next. I think Hassan is way too consumed in this bubble, but so is everybody else. It's like a person who only watches Tucker Carlson and they're like, I watch the news. That's not how it works. But again, I, I'm trying to make this point to remember, like, all of us are susceptible to this. All of us fall into this at time. Like, all of us, all of us are just people doing our best. And so Hassan's doing his best. Ethan's doing his best. Everyone's doing their best. Whether you call them a terrorist or not, they're doing what they think is right. And that is the hardest pill for any of us to swallow. By educating one extra person, whether it's you or thousands of others that watch, that learn what the truth actually is mm. um, and, and change their minds and then go out and protest, go out and, and spread the truth to other people. That's why I do it. And, I'm, uh, and I've been doing this for, especially this, like this is an issue that I've spoken about for years at this point, 10 years professionally in public life. I've spoken out against Israel's actions because like a lot of people only 
became more knowledgeable of like the th stuff that Israel was doing after October 7. Oh, oh, this has been ongoing. This this video is from three years ago. By the way, I'm an example of this because yeah. I always thought Israel were the homies. Yeah. That's kind of how there was Peyton as me as an average guy from Michigan. Well, they are the homies if that's your goal. Everyone's your homie. Like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the reality is like, it depends on your goal. All of this is subjective. So you know how I believe in constructs? I think everything is a construct. All of this is a construct. And you choosing the construct is what this is about. Now, again, this is really difficult because to be honest with you, if I say this all the time, I get along with everyone, but I disagree with everybody. I think everyone is wrong. I think we're all deeply wrong about how we understand life. And I think that it, everyone is deeply wrong about how they understand it. And everyone is in survival mode and everybody is traumatized and everybody just keeps reacting to each other. These people, they're being bombed. They have no chances to sit and breathe and think, what do I want? All they can think is I'm Israeli. All they can think is I'm Palestinian. All they can think is, am I going to die today? Of course, you have no time to do anything but react. You're literally on the verge of death every second of every day. And this is the construct we've created through years and years and generations and generations of power-seeking hungry people, right? So for me, I can't side with Hassan 100% on these conflicts, nor can I side 100% with any of these people because none of these people have a solution where they admit, like, this is disgusting and we've been disgusting towards each other, but it's so human, huh? Like, that's the irony. It is so human for us just to react and have no time to think. And then we, more than that, think we know everything about, we think human beings think they know so much about the universe. They think they know how we got here. They think a God literally put them here, that a God is, is fighting with them. And that's amazing. What an amazing evolutionary anomaly or not even anomaly, but like reality that human beings, like these biological creatures manifested a construct that gave them so much like perseverance and it's kind of interesting we just went to college yeah so that's the picture so, that was kind of painted to me growing up so as someone who's been doing this for years and years and years i've never i never thought that there would be this much outward support for palestinians because five six years ago when i said stuff like this people would be like you're anti-semitic you're the most anti-semitic person I've ever true and hassan has done that because he is a muslim and because he sees that part of the world because he knows really great muslims he knows really great people and he knows that they're being painted unfairly by the west which is true islamophobia is rampant here muslims are seen as scary people like all of these things are true right now when i observe this story and we're not done watching videos but Okay, I need to get through this part. When I was thinking about this and who Hassan is and what this Yemeni soldier is and what's going on. Okay, so obviously like Ethan is like run of the mill, two bubble, grew up in a privileged position in life, never questioned really his own bubble or like how to dismantle it type thing. And even when he does question it, he never deeply goes into it. It's not like he's, he just kind of understands it very shallowly, but okay, whatever. He's like successful in the world, whatever. He's a good dad, good, good husband, blah, blah, blah. Good friend, da, 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 da. Well, objectively. Um, Hassan is the person who grew up too much of an outsider to not have to question. As much as anti-Semitism is a reality for Jewish people, they're not as much of an outsider as like a Muslim would be in the West. And that's because the West has been an ally of Israel for long enough that they have a place in society. I mean, I learned about them as, as like children growing up. We focus so much as on as, on Jews. We focus so much on how much they needed to be protected. Like I got I got classes after classes about how we had to keep Jews safe. I never got that over Muslims, I got the opposite, that all Muslims are terrorists, that all people from the Middle East are terrorists, that even, you know, uh, internalized, like, um, like internalized racism from my own people, my own relatives who were like, yeah, we have to go to Iraq, we have to liberate those people, all these things. Okay, not that Saddam and all these leaders weren't good people, like weren't bad people, they were bad people, right? But when we... <laughs> Go through life trying to figure out who we are in the story. It reminds me so much of Avatar The Last Airbender. Okay, so only cultured people will understand this reference. And Avatar The Last Airbender, and I think this is so important, there are so many examples of different bubbles that are all part of the same communities, but the communities explain the war that's happening differently. If you're bossing, say there is no war. 
there are, you know, villages and communities of kids whose lives were ravished by um, the Fire Nation. And so they only look at the Fire Nation as evil. Then Aang and his friends go to the Fire Nation and realize, like, oh, they're just people. The same way Aang goes to the Fire Nation and realizes, like, these people are nice. There's just some people with biased ideas. That's Muslims. That's America. That's Israel. We're all the Fire Nation. We are all the Fire Nation in different ways to different people. But ultimately, like, our babies cry just like yours. And the only, only difference keeping us separate is the constructs we've created to, like, validate our realities that's how i look at humanity humanity dictate is dictated by the construct they've created or maintained and because of the construct we create good and bad guys but those 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 ideas you're creating that bias from it's not like real it's only real because you've created it and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy it's a self-fulfilling prophecy right like israel's like i'm afraid of palestinians palestinians are i'm afraid of israel and then you sit there and you're so afraid of each other all you can do is fight so this Yemeni soldier that Hassan is obsessed with, tell me this is not correct. Okay, I'm open to being wrong. But is Hassan not Katara when she's in love with Jet? Do you remember Katara seeing this man and being like, oh my God, he's so cool. Look at the way he like fights the Fire Nation. Oh my God, look at his cool friends. Ooh, look at the way he like dominates those Fire Nation soldiers, bro. And Hassan is wet in his pants the way Katara was for Jet. This is the Yemeni soldier. Jet is that soldier. And let me tell you how wrong Jet was. And why was Jet wrong? Because he dehumanized the Fire Nation in order to justify his pain he felt when they destroyed his family. And it was the wrong decision. That's why we have that episode of when it goes into the Fire Nation and makes friends with people there because at the end of the day, whether you're Palestinian or Israeli, we are all the same. And you let your pain and your trauma turn you into jet. And so you become a freedom fighter, but you become also an act of terror. And this is how I see this situation. And I think I'm right. And I, I can't fault anybody in the story for feeling this way. How human. That doesn't mean we don't work to give them another, another avenue. OK, it doesn't mean we don't give them another way to to give them a way out of feeling this way. And I really I really appreciate chat being so on board with this because I really think I hit the head. I think I hit the nail on the head, bro. Like, I, I really think this is correct. And this is why I think I have so much empathy for everybody in the situation, because all I have to do is think like, OK, what if, what if I was Jet? What if I was this? Chat says, are you calling Palestinians Fire Nation? I'm saying we are all the Fire Nation. America, Israel, Palestine, Sweden, everybody. Everybody has been the Fire Nation to somebody. Because the Fire Nation are just people with beliefs. They are not different from you and me. Bossing say the Earth Kingdom? They kept their people in the dark, bro. You are not different from us. We all keep our people in the dark somehow because we keep ourselves in, our, in the dark with our cognitive dissonance. The idea about Avatar The Last Airbender that I think a lot of people missed is that we are all human and that's the trouble of it all. It's not a centrist take. Chat's like centrist take. Y'all are really comparing the Fire Nation to Palestine. No offense. This is the two position and this is why my work is superior. This is why my work is right. From a five perspective, only the twos think saying your babies cry like our babies is a centrist position. Centrists don't, can't even start to comprehend the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're not talking about only those people. We are talking about humanity. That's the point. Palestine is jet, definitely not the Fire Nation. <sighs> I think you're missing the metaphor. Like the point is, is that to Israelis, Palestine feels like this immovable force that's like ruining their lives and that are scary. Okay, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm open-minded, wait. What if, okay, what if Palestine isn't the fire nation because they don't have the government power, if we're being too literal about it? Okay, if we're being very literal about it, Palestine wouldn't be the fire nation. They would be, who's one of the under, oh, 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 they would be Korra. You remember Korra? You remember the freedom, the bald guy who could like airbend and fly? That would be Palestine, right? Maybe? How would your take manifest into a solution? There are no solutions. There are only people. That is the issue with two bubbles. And the two bubble, they only want the solutions. But the solution, you will not accept it. The solution is to mind your own.
business and to meditate. The solution is to realize everything is a construct, but you're not going to do that because fear will stop you and you'll need to be on the side of somebody. No, Red Lotus. Yeah. White Lotus, good, good people. Red Lotus. Is that the Cora people? Maybe that's who Palestine is. But, the, but if we're going to go very literal, you are the fire nation, depending on where you are in the equation, you are the fire nation, depending on the perception in which you are being perceived. It's always about perception. Everything is perception. How are you being perceived by the people that you are oppressing, whether you like it or not? Like, you know, how Hassan kept saying, like, Palestinians don't have time to fight for gay rights because they're being bombed. True. And it, as Manu is right, if Palestine is liberated, it's still going to be misogynistic and homophobic and transphobic. That doesn't mean they deserve to be hurt, bombed. You know what I mean? It's that like that doesn't mean they're set up to be like eradicated because they're homophobic. Like just because you're OK, I'll give you a good example. This is how Palestinians feel. So Israel says we have to bomb Palestine because amongst all of these civilians, there's Hamas soldiers, right? There's terrorists. OK, do you think there are Nazis in America? Do you think there are racists in America? So that's like somebody coming in saying we have to bomb parts of America to get rid of some of the Nazis and some of the people in this country that we feel are terrorists. That's how it feels to be Palestinian. Now, the justification for bombing Palestine, regardless of the fact that they're using it as like they say Hamas uses Palestinians as human shields. Israel is using Hamas as a shield and a justification to kill civilians, in my opinion. OK, so I want to give you an example of a two bubble. And how they think about um, how they think about what Israel, quote, has to do to, to protect themselves. OK, why they think of Palestinians the way they do and now. Hold on. I don't. This is a really weird example. So I need you to bear with me. And I chose this person for a very particular reason. OK, because I actually <laughs> I watched a lot of random videos to figure out how to talk about this subject today, because, you know, like I'm a story person. And I think we're all just like in a story. So there's a Israeli artist who's very famous that I actually don't know anything about. But they came up at, when I was researching this as a discussion because they said some really abhorrent things a couple days ago about Palestinians. They're called Mati Sh Mati C. Oh, I don't even know how to say their name, guys. Help me. I'm going to put it in chat. I don't even know how to say their name. But apparently they have. Um, very big, like they're very, very popular, like 62 million views on videos and all this. Listen to the way this person talks about Palestinians. And I want to explain to you how he sees himself as the good guy, even though everything he's saying is what a bad guy would say. A bad guy in an anime, not a bad guy in real life, because in real life, we all think we're the good guys, right? Okay, so watch this. And this is just a section. It's going to get pretty descriptive. He's going to get really like anti-Palestinian, okay? When when the when the Hamas attack happened, you know, twenty two hundred rockets got launched. Uh, Three thousand Hamas soldiers breached Israel. Uh, Eleven hundred thirty nine people, including eight eight hundred fifteen civilians, were killed, mostly at the festival. Two hundred fifty one people were kidnapped. Uh, that was horrific. The response from Israel and the number of civilians that were killed in Gaza and so forth, I felt was horrific as well i felt but that it was extremely heavy-handed and it didn't need to, to happen in that fashion i feel that there's fault on both sides human shields you understand the concept right these I, are I not understand, armies but battling. you have to work around those human shields to a certain degree because you are killing sure. those humans who have nothing to do with the conflict except that they are cheering in the streets when when seven and 18 year old girls with their legs twi okay so just really fast so this is an emotional argument. He's zoomed in. He's in his body. He's in the place. I'm having a car conversation zoomed out, right? Because what's happening right now is we're seeing history in motion because we're always living history. Look, none of us will matter. We're all, we're all going to die one day. But while we're here, it'd be really nice to have a good life together, right? It'd be really nice to have a good life together. So how do we have a good life together until we humble ourselves and recognize like we are living history? So like that PragerU video we watched yesterday, which was propaganda that said, you know, Christopher Columbus was like, how can you judge me for what I've done 500 years in the past? Okay, we're in the present. We're in the present. So what's going to be our excuse for what we're doing to Palestine, right? What's going to be the story that our great, great, great grandkids get to tell themselves 
about what we're doing to Palestine now, right? So that's the problem. We aren't 500 years ago. This isn't Christopher Columbus. This is now. Okay, so what are we going to do? Listen to how this man is in this emotional argumentation for this situation, right? Twisted backwards, blood pouring out, are being brought in pickup trucks. They're spitting on them and cheering like, you know, so there is a question as. If you saw the videos from October 7th, you would feel incredibly angry at Palestinians. They're disgusting videos. If you watch the videos of what's happening to Palestinians right now, you should feel very angry at Israel. And then you should decide what that means. How can I watch videos from both persons' perspectives and be angry at both of them? What is this? And that's the thing that people need to do because those videos on October 7th were very bad. The videos of Palestinians being harassed, hurt, and murdered by Israelis are horrible. They're absolutely horrendous, okay? None of us are innocent in life. We are only here to harm reduce, and that's it, and then we die. As to, at the same time, there are videos of Gazans saying, free us from Hamas, get us out of here. You know, so right. it is a question. I haven't been to Gaza. I don't really know what the people of Gaza feel, but I, I, I see some shit, you know? You, you have to make, you have to kind of judge to some extent to some extent, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, it's just like a serious, serious thing. So let me ask you a personal question, right? I don't know if you okay. have a family. Let's say you live uh, in New York City, right? In New Jersey, there's a group of maniacs that want you dead. They come into your house on Saturday morning when you're unarmed. They shoot your wife in front of your head. They put your babies in an oven and make you watch them while they burn in an oven. Then they take you back to a tunnel where they keep you for 300 days and shoot you in the head, right? Let me ask you, if, you, if this happens to you, what, is your, what are you going to do? You're going to go. Listen to what he thinks you're going to do. Go to in Jersey and look for your family if they're held hostage, and you're going to do whatever the fuck you have to do. You that is a man dream. That's, that's, mas that's toxic masculinity. So the dream is, if my family's taken hostage, I'm going to be like Liam Neeson and taken, and I'm going to go in there, boom, boom, and I'm going to go into guns blazing. So he would do that if his family was taken. What do you think Palestinians are doing? They're doing that. What do you think October 7th was? October 7th was Hamas doing this as a version of their, their de decision to do this, and they're sort of, this is how people see them. They see them going in to liberate themselves, whether you like it or not, whether it's true in every facet, it doesn't matter. There's obviously like political games being played. There's bad actors being played. But a lot of people just want Israel to leave them alone. A lot of Israelis just want Palestinians to leave them alone. But you can't because you have to get along your neighbors. You have to get along your neighbors and your neighbors who are arguing about who deserves to be there more. I've heard from Israelis say that Palestine has never been a real place. It's never been on a map. But I've seen Palestinian families talk about their lineage, where they've come from. They've obviously migrated from different places, right? And then we have to argue about like, oh, well, who is here first? What are you, five years old? What are you, five years old? Well, I was sitting there first. What are you, what are you, a fucking kindergartner? These are families who are here. Make it work. What do you mean? What do you mean who is here first? We're 100 years into this conflict. Figure it out. There's no more these people need to leave. There's only how do we get along? But of course, it's not going to happen. Because people are too in their bubbles, right? It's too ingrained in their trauma. This is trauma. Trauma and fear make you make really bad decisions a lot of the time. And he is making some very strong statements that he would be upset if he heard a Palestinian say. You know what I'm saying? This idea that uh, we're supposed to just sit back I mean, bro. If you think it is as simple, chat says it's Palestine is under occupation. There's no right or wrong here. Or there's a right and wrong here. There is a right or wrong. There isn't a solution to whatever is right or wrong. And I think you're wrong. I think you're simplifying a very complicated issue. Because ultimately, we're all on stolen land. Most of us live on stolen land. Most of us, like, we're evolved animals. Like, I don't know why you're think you like, I don't know why you think you're on a planet. But I think all of this is a construct and there's no objective morality. We are simply animals learning to get along. Right? So like I, with peace and love, to hold a position that you think it's simple is to hold the position that you're not also on stolen land. So you have to make a decision about what it could, like, 
what it means to even be alive, like literally alive. What does it even mean to exist on the planet? I'm asking you to zoom out and completely contextualize your life as a breathing human being, not as an Israeli, not as a Palestinian. Who would you be if you weren't these things? Because you are more than these things, yes? You are more than your body. You are more than your skin color. You're more than your orientation. We exist outside of these prescriptions. We exist outside of these constructs. And we exist outside of how people see us. I'm going to let him finish for a little while more, and then we're going to go to the second example. Don't get me started, man. I'm, I'm not saying that everyone's supposed to sit back. I understand what you're saying, but as of— What are we supposed to do? This, all the bombs well, are in on. schools. They're all under— they're all, this, what, do we ha what can we do except murder children in Palestine? All the bombs are in their schools. Listen to the way he justifies it. We have to do it. We have to do it. We have to do it. In schools. They're all underneath schools. They're all under— in bedrooms missiles no, underneath kids beds I, I get it I tunnels get it. the I'm, tunnels I'm, are I'm under Jewish the myself. schools I, I understand conceptually what's happening they I, send they send a memo they tell people you got to leave at the very least they'd send a memo they fucking so this is a story i've heard from israelis a lot where they're like britney they send memos they like put on sirens they like send out notes to palestinians to leave that area this is propaganda even if you do that do you think it makes it better and this is about harm reduction so in some ways sure great thank you for warning palestinians that you're about to bomb their hospitals and their schools so they have time to evacuate we couldn't even get hospital victims evacuated from hurricane um hurricane which which one just happened hurricane what's his name it just happened. Herman, what was it? We just had a hurricane happen in the United States. We couldn't even get hospitals evacuated and we had like a week's notice. And you want Palestinians and it, Milton, thank you. You want Palestinians to evacuate when they start hearing a siren or getting notes and pamphlets flown down from them? What are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? Oh, good. Good job, Israel. Thanks for giving us a 10 minute warning that you're about to kill everybody. Sure. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, Milton, Hurricane Milton. Okay, so this guy, I'm like, who is this guy? Why is my feed sending me who this man is? Do you know who this is? This is an Israeli reggae musical artist. I can't play his music for you because I'll get copyrighted, but go listen to it. It's one, so bad. And two, hilarious that he has a song called One Day, released in 2009, which people saw as like one of the most beautiful songs. Everyone's like, we really need this song right now. This song would help heal the world right now. The lyrics are one day, one day. Sometimes I lay under the moon and thank God I'm breathing. Then I pray, don't make me soon. Don't take me soon because I'm here for a reason. Sometimes in my tears, I drown, but I never let it get me down. So when negativity surrounds, I know someday it will all turn around because all my life I've been waiting for I've been praying for, for the people to say that we don't want to fight no more, that there will be no more wars and our children will play. It's not about win or lose because we all lose when they feed on the souls of the innocent. Bleach drenched, pave, blood drenched pavement. Keep on moving though. The waters stay raging. In this mage, you can lose your way, your way. It might drive you crazy, but don't let it phase you. No way, no way. And everyone's like, yo, that song would have been so powerful right now. This man just said we have to bomb schools in Palestine because there's bombs there. How do you know there are bombs there? Because somebody told you that. And maybe there is. But is it in the same way that George Bush told us there were, you know, nukes in Iran or Iraq? Like, is it the same way or weapons of mass destruction that we never found, by the way? Like, it feels like how are you so trusting of a government that's willing to take advantage of you and not understand this is all for power? OK, so here's this guy who made millions of dollars singing about music that was about peace and is really speaking about music that's like about peace or a Jewish American. I don't know which, but like speaking about peace and all this, beautiful, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, boom, here he is. You can drop shit from the sky. Leaflets. They tell people, get the f out of here. We're going in. We're going to find these tunnels. We're looking for our hostages, right. innocent civilians that you came, broke down the wall and brought back to your place. You think they didn't have this in mind? This is exactly I, what they want. I, They're a fucking I death cult. That, but they are a death as of cult. This date, they, ooh, they are a death cult. Mm. Well, want their on. people dead. <laughs> they want their people dead so that the rest of the world will come against Israel. You know, it's it's not hard to see. I, I, I understand, and I understand how it's playing and out they say it in the media very clearly. Because, because no, no, they as, say as this. Date, on this date, forty-three thousand people have been killed. 
41,000 Palestinians and about 1,700 Israelis. Those numbers is what people have a problem with. I don't have a problem with those numbers. You don't I, have you a wouldn't problem have a, with 41,000 Palestinians You wouldn't being have a problem killed. with it if it was your f- two-year-old Many in the of tunnel. Which, most of which... Are- I have a problem with it. And that's the point. Israel feels like a kid. Yeah, somebody kicked your shin, so you went and stabbed them in the eye. And it's like, hey, hey, no. Like, the retaliation isn't appropriate. Because ultimately, Israel wants to be the victor. So in real time, we're watching Palestine being targeted by a bigger force with more military backing to basically be wiped out in the process of what we call a political war. Call it a genocide, call it whatever you want, but it ends with Palestine not having any sort of say in that land. That's what it looks like, as much as we want to say otherwise. And look, there's plenty of reasons why humans do these things, okay? I get it, right? Humans are going to human. But it is one of those things where like these Israelis are afraid and they're so scared, but they're scared in the way that Christians are scared in America because they're afraid that, like they're going to be discriminated against by the gay people. You hold the power. You hold the power. You are the one in power. And that's the part that like is very hard to listen to Israelis talk about their play. It sounds like when a white guy says like being a white guy is the hardest thing in the whole world in America. And you're like black and trans and you're like, what? That's what Israel sounds like. So I, I, when a white man complains to me about how hard life is, I can empathize with him, sympathize. And I can say, I feel you. It is so hard to be human because everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. You are not exempt. Nobody is without suffering. So if like a billionaire white guy is talking to me about how he just lost his mom, I'm like, that is so horrible, my bro. He's like, yeah, dude, my mom died, but you know, at least we were in a hospital and I could stay with her during hospice and she got the best doctors and she died peacefully. I'm like, man, that's beautiful. I'm so sorry your mom died though. And then he goes, yeah, man, I really know how Palestinians feel right now. You know, they're losing their parents every day. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, I don't like to compare traumas or pain, but like, but when you start comparing, now I'm going to get defensive of the people you are comparing against. OK, like I'm going to I'm going to start getting defensive. And that's what it feels like. It feels like people are trying to say, oh, my gosh, look at the pain I'm in. Yes, but you understand, like you are technically in less pain. Does Israel genuinely think they are technically in more pain than Palestinians? And again, I don't want to compare pain. But technically, Palestinians are literally in more pain. So, again, it's hard to want to sit there and root for anyone but the underdog, even if you don't completely un- like defend or the underdog's belief systems, right? Even if you don't completely defend the underdog, it's hard not to root for the underdog. And it's all, like I said, I can cry with, with Israelis. I, those videos on October 7th are just horrible, right? They're horrible. But in contrast, it's like, okay, when you see this guy, you're like, okay, bro, I'm annoyed with you. Okay. Now another video I want to show you. Okay. I just warn you right now. I'm going to show you a Gabor Mate video. He's a very slow talker. Okay. I'm sure a lot of you know who Gabor is. Um, Gabor Mate, if you guys don't actually know, is, uh, usually see him on psychology, TikTok. He talks a lot about ADHD. He wrote a book on it, which is pretty cool. But more than that, um, Gabor Mate is a infant Holocaust survivor. And he has very strong words about Israel and Palestine and particularly the actions we're taking against Palestine. He considers them abhor- like abhorrent, right? Somebody who deals with trauma in my work and who speaks so much and words really are my metier. The words fail me at this point. Um, it's difficult to explain how I perceive the situation. But in a certain deep sense, I feel that it's the worst thing I've seen in my whole life. And uh, it's impossible to compare atrocities. I mean, nothing compares with the mechanized murder of five, six million Jews by the Nazis. Uh, <clears throat> what can compare to the slaughter of three million Vietnamese civilians by the Americans? Um, the many murders and mass killings that are not even reported in the Western press such as the Indian Asian genocide in East Timor, 
such as the killing of 100,000 Guatemalan indigenous people in the 1990s by the American and the Israeli trained the brutal military in that country. One could go on. But what is different about this is that I've never seen anything so publicly committed, such atrocities perpetrated on television, and the victims are presented as the, uh, as the perpetrators. And either this spectacle, this obscene, vicious, vicious spectacle that we're subjected to is either supported or condoned by the major media, major media and all the politicians. Now, um, it's obligatory, and I think it's even necessary to say, this is my point of view, is that what happened on October 7th wasn't justifiable, that the killings of civilians, whatever details may yet emerge about intentions or what actually happened, that's not something that should have happened. That was something horrible, and it was an atrocity. But even the need to say that comes out of a culture in which the atrocities of the other side are never called out. No Israeli spokesman, when they talk about their policies, ever asked, do you condemn the uh, the pogrom at Hawara in, uh, in the West Bank earlier this year? Do you condemn the killings of Palestinian children by settlers? Do you, do you condemn the regular attacks by the settlers? Do you understand that the former deputy chief of staff of the Israeli army said that the situation of the Palestinians in the West Bank reminds him of the situation of Jews in Germany. Is this even reported in the Western press? And what he meant by is that the settlers like the Nazi hooligans are free to attack the Palestinians as the Nazis, thugs, the brown shirts were free to attack Jews and the army and the police not only stood by, they aided and abetted them. Is the Western public made aware of the thousands of Jewish, Israeli rabbis and historians and intellectuals who recently signed a document calling the present situation clearly apartheid? Are you aware that the former head of Mossad has said that the situation of the Palestinians under the occupation is apartheid? And so when anybody is asked to speak about perpetrations on the Palestinian side, they're immediately asked to condemn and to denounce and to reject. And yet the daily suffering, crucifixion of the Palestinian people, and including and especially the people in Gaza, nobody's ever called to task, nobody's ever questioned, and these smooth-faced liars in the Israeli army who um, could give less, who would give lessons to Goebbels, jo Joseph Goebbels, who are, who are masters of propaganda, like Goebbels never was. They're allowed to get away. Okay, so there's this idea that what we're doing is we're hopping into different bubbles, per, like bubble perspectives on the same conflict. So this is how like a trauma specialist would react to it, like an infant Holocaust survivor, right? It's like this idea that regardless of who's doing it, it's wrong, just like it is wrong, to wish for the genocide of homophobes because our homophobes are even racist because they're racist. It's wrong to go over and attack a group of people because you decided they were bad guys. Like humans are all on a journey of good and bad and good and bad is a construct we created through culture and culture is a construct. And so it's not that we're here to justify quote bad behavior. It's here, we're here to deconstruct that bad behavior, right? Because even when you have peace amongst nations, you're still dealing with racism you're still like there's still prejudice and peace like we're still dealing with a lot of discrimination like there's still a lot to deal and it's layers the layers we're dealing with so we're going to a very messy situation that's very very hard to like deconstruct i mean literally professional scholars and educators have been trying to deconstruct this situation for years and people like me and people like Hassan and people like Ethan at the end of the day, like we don't even understand it the way they do and they can't deconstruct it, right? Like they can't pull it apart enough. Like they're still debating. So this idea of like, okay, but what's your solution? There are no solutions. It, there are no solutions. There are only problems to deconstruct. 
solutions show up after deconstruction because that's how we figure it out. What we figure out is a cope. There is no solutions. There are only like temporary copes. And then when you deconstruct, you come across. But then ultimately, when you pop all the bubbles and you get to like what I call like stage five of introspection, you still end up having to live in a world with people on different levels. And so we all have to meet people where they are, even ourselves, especially ourselves. It's not like, okay, I'm a five. So now I know everything about the universe. No, you become a five and you realize you know nothing. I don't know what to do for Israel and Palestine. Why would I? I'm not God. And neither are you. You don't know what to do for them. They don't even know what to do for themselves. They don't even have the wisdom to know what to do for themselves. In the same way you see a family arguing and you don't understand why siblings can't get together and get along, we don't know how to solve these problems. And that's the dilemma. You think, oh, but there is a solution. There's only a solution if you've decided you want a certain outcome. Sure, if you have a certain outcome in mind, I'm sure you have plenty of solutions. I'm sure that outcome in every way benefits you and probably f***s over everybody else. But sure, solutions are based off prescriptions. Prescriptions are based off outcomes of desire. My only outcome of desire that I have is that humanity moves in a direction of harm reduction. So there's nothing to ask of humanity except to introspect. Think about how you are also participating in harm reduction or not harm reduction. But certainly justifying the bombing of Palestinians is probably not a part of harm reduction. Not harm reduction that's worth it. Now, if you want to go the Aaron Yeager route, sure, wipe out all of Palestine. I'm sure that worked out perfectly good for Aaron Yeager, right? Just wipe everybody out as if humans don't create more babies and cycles don't continue in different ways. That's sarcasm, by the way, for new people in my audience. Aaron Yeager is the bad guy of Attack on Titan in case nobody understood that story. What Aaron did didn't help. It wasn't a solution. It was a temporary cope. Human beings are like these biological animals and they're going to have more babies that create this problem later on somewhere else on the planet. Okay. So you can keep arguing that this was a solution, but it's not. It's not a solution. And what, what, what even happened to Aaron, right? As it went along, he went insane. He went insane with this ultimate solution he thought was so good for the world. Now, of course, if you're not a person who learns through stories, one, I think you're heavily missing out. But the reason we look at stories is so we can zoom out of our own ego and our own pain and really look at it and say, okay, what is the solution here? Who do I want to be in the story? And no matter how you splice it, nobody in the Palestine conflict or the Israeli conflict, nobody's where they should be in the story. They are always, but they are where they are. It's not where they should be, but it's where they are. You got to meet people where they are. So how do we get them to a place where they should be? And should is a construct of a prescription based off of outcome desired. So then if you deconstruct that, there is no should. There only is. Let's keep going. He has one more thing I want you guys to listen to. Wait with it. No, I'm speaking emotionally now. It's not. He said, I'm speaking emotionally now. They're allowed to get away with it. No, I'm speaking emotionally now. It's not helpful sometimes to speak emotionally because people get repelled by the anger or by the outrage that one generates. I understand the grief on both sides. I understand the sorrow. I've had communication from Israeli friends who are actually sympathetic to the Palestinian side, who are just in fear, who are... Um, full of thoughts of revenge. I get that, I understand it. But surely in this situation, whoever you are, whichever your side you're on, you gotta get past your feelings. You can understand your feelings, you can accept them, but you owe it, if you want truth, and if you want peace, and if you want justice, you can't just go by feelings. Feelings that are conditioned by decades of propaganda, decades of weaponizing, the suffering of Jews as a baton with which to beat the Palestinians. You gotta get past that. And you have to actually ask yourself, do I really know what's going on? Mm. Have I stood one second even in my mind in the shoes of the other? Have I tried to understand what's happening to those people? If they committed certain acts that are hateful, what drove them to that hate? Did the Palestinians come to Europe to attack Jews? Or did something happen in that in their land 
that made them so desperate. And finally, I'll only say that what happened there is not a secret. It's been documented. It's been written up by Israeli historians. I could name five of them right off the bat. Tom Segev, um, uh, um, Simha Flapan, um, Ilan Pape, um, um, many others by Israeli journalists. None of this is even vaguely controversial from the historical point of view. And the fact that we live in such a bubble, and this bubble is created by the same Western press. The fact that we live in such a bubble, and this bubble is created by the same Western press that brought us the Iraq war and the weapons of mass destruction. People now regret the Iraq war 20 years later. Even my conservative parents who were so pro the Iraq war when it happened, including myself as a young voter, Obviously, that was a horrible idea in the way that we did it. It was hor Everything was horrible. Our intentions were obviously bad. America obviously had bad intentions. And 9-11 didn't come out of nowhere. It, it wasn't isolated. It came because of everything that came before us. Israel's desire to protect itself is the same justification anybody uses to protect itself. I don't want to, honestly, I don't want to live in Israel and I don't want to live under bin Laden. Not that we can't, can because he's dead. But I wouldn't want to live in Palestine in the same way I wouldn't want to live in Israel. I barely want to live anywhere, if I'm being honest. Every country has its problems. I barely want to live in America. Actually, I don't live in America, for the record. But, like, I still pay my tax, girl. I don't even want to live there. It's not the worst place on Earth, but it's not the best place. But I'm not convinced there is a best place. I actually take the radical stance that no place on Earth is a safe space as long as there's humans. Because humans are too good at justifying really bad behavior. And yes, the Kuwaiti incubator children leading to the death of 500,000 Iraqi civilians, the same Western press that brought us the Vietnam War. When Martin Luther King spoke out against the Vietnam War, do you remember what the New York Times said? New York Times said, this time he crossed over the line. It's that same press. You might want to ask yourself, why are they so... The question is, are we going to learn from our past mistakes? Are we going to learn about, like, if the New York Times or who did he say? Who did he say the New York Times? If they went after Martin Luther King for saying Vietnam was bad, and we all, like, regret Vietnam, right? Bad decision. What are we doing now? And look, what am I doing right now? What are you doing right now? All of us are going to do something right now that in 10 years we're going to be like, why did I do that? And it's not just our governments. It's us as individuals in our own personal lives. If you are getting wiser and if you are growing then you will always look back at your past self and go, oh, I see the mistake I made there. And that is why humanity is so messy because we're never perfect and it's why we can only harm redu re reduce, right? We can't seek perfection. It's not going to happen. Either passive or enth enthusiastic cheerleaders for this genocide. Are you really going to trust them? Are you going to try and find out for yourself? So yes, I'm speaking with a lot of emotion now. I did give it into you an extensive one, a longer one, not so emotionally laden as these words have been now. But in light of the latest news from Gaza with the apparently the cell phones, the internet being cut off and the yeah. bombing and the bombings being escalated. Now this is eleven months ago. So this is like this is a Gabor Mate from Eleven months ago. So this is like a different version of him talking about the conflict. So now we're here at this point. So again. I just want to make it very clear that I do think everyone tries to harm reduce in their own way, but some people as individuals aren't as interested in that, right? Chat says, then we shouldn't support how Hassan is using his platform. He doesn't seem to be trying to harm reduce at all. I'm just so curious. Did nothing I say matter in the last 40 minutes? He's obviously trying to harm reduce. You just don't like the way he's doing it. Like he's obviously trying to harm reduce. You just don't like the way he's good doing it, which is the conflict we all have. Oh, I don't like the way he's doing it, though. I'm sorry. Do you have a better way of doing it? Because the truth is, is that we are all that is the chaos of the world. We are always arguing about who is harm reducing the best. Well, you're not doing it the best way possible. So I, my way is better. Is it? Because the way you're doing it is still not better than somebody else doing it. So maybe none of us should do it. Harm reduction is subjective to the perception. Everybody is trying to harm reduce. We're just disagreeing on how to do it. But it doesn't mean that it's not happening. 
Okay? It doesn't mean it's not happening. So again, this is why bubbles are so fascinating to my brain. Because when I deconstructed and I realized like, oh, all of human beings literally are living in constructs, it made me one more empathetic and two, much more accepting and radically peaceful when it comes to the world. Because at the end of the day, like they are doing their best, whether we believe it or not, whether we believe it or not, they are doing their best. We just don't want to accept that it's good, good enough for now, but it's never good enough in the same way. It's not good enough in your own singular life that you don't do the things you know you're supposed to do. Everybody's a bad person and everybody's a good person, depending on who's telling the story. If you truly believe you're the good person in the story, you better double check. Because everybody thinks that. And everybody probably is. Except at that split moment and that one time and that, that like singular moment in your life when you're not. This is like what's really like important. So think about it this way. Everybody is a good person until they're existing in that singular moment when they're not. And that singular moment can last a lifetime. Because a baby is a good person, right? Until that baby turns four and stabs somebody in the eye because it was curious. And then maybe they're not a bad baby, but they did a bad thing. Or maybe I'll go a little older. That kid's nine years old. He got a gun from his dad's closet and shot up a school. Okay. Well, that baby was a good person until the singular moment. And that singular moment is either going to last a lifetime or we're going to deconstruct it. This idea we have in our lives that like, oh, I know what's bad. I know what's good. What you know is what you think is bad and good, but you do not know it outside of that perception. And that's why I say, I don't think human beings have access to objective truth. How could you know what exists outside of your own perception if what you think is good and bad is completely dictated by your own values? It's not even dictated. What are you dictating it on? Like, what are you dictating it on? How you think the world should be. And so this extends to everybody. And I'm not, that's why I'm saying like, when you pick a side, you're just picking the side that works for you. But you think you're picking the side that's right or that's true or that's the right decision based off what? Based off of what? Chess says, that's why I said to watch the entire Ethan video because I don't think... Even you would call him harm reduction. I'm not talking about who he is as a good person in the story. If there can be harm reduction, then causing harm also exists. And also Hassan is causing harm, even if it's on the micro. I don't think you know what harm reduction is, maybe. Right? Like, you don't harm reduce across the board. A singular action might not be harm reduction, right? But, like, everyone is harm reducing in their own ways. So I don't know if you mean specifically about this one instance or what you mean, but I think I'm a little confused at your point, right? Because I'm, again, I know it's hard because everyone keeps going in and out of like the perceptions. We're talking about macro, about the micro. Like that's what the conversation is ultimately about. Chat says a lot of what Ethan is saying sounds like all lives matter. I think it I think it is like the centrist view of like all lives matter. Look, okay, so centrists will say all lives matter. Okay. Or maybe Republicans or whoever will say it. The group will say all lives matter. And they mean that in the most superficial way with no desire to deconstruct. Then we get to level five on my introspection scale. And I want to say like, you know, all lives matter, right? And then no lives matter. They only matter in the in the perception way, and they matter in the sense that a blade of grass matters. Like, ultimately, human life is just as valuable as any other life form on this planet. And there's no reason to think otherwise. But because we play hierarchy games, then the question is, well, Brittany, if my life is just important as a flower, who are you going to save when the building is burning, a flower or a human? I don't know. Depends on the situation. Probably the human. Maybe the flower. Maybe just myself. I don't know. You have this illusion, right? One, I would know what I would do if I was in that situation. You don't. And two, that my life matters more than other people. So then you start to say, well, my life matters more than a flower. Okay. 
Then you go, well, I think my life matters more than a man's. My life matters more than a religious person's. My life matters more than a Palestinian's. Mm. It starts with the flower and ends with the human. And so at the end of the day, when we're having these conversations, I just see a bunch of people who are making decisions on what works for them, but they keep saying it's for everybody else. It's not for everybody else. It's for you. And that's okay. It's just a little cognitive dissonance to think like, but I know what's morally superior. I know what's morally correct. You know what you think is morally correct. And at the end of the day, these are all just YouTubers as a reminder. And even Gabor Mate and all these other people, they're just people. Whether they're experts or not, they're just people doing their best. They're not perfect. We can't look for one person to guide us. Like that's why we create the construct of a God. Because the illusion comforts us and lets us think, oh yeah, this one being has all the answers for us. And if we just listen to them, they'll tell us what to do. But no human like that exists. So every time someone says, but what are your solutions? To fuck your mom tonight, bro, without a condom so you can have a, a little brother on the way. That's my solution. Don't ask stupid questions. Ethan is making a statement because of increasing anti-Semitism. His sound just makes more money by being increasingly more extreme as, with his beliefs. What does extreme mean? Can you guys tell me what extreme means? Like, what does that mean? Because usually that means outside of reason, right? Extreme kind of means like outside of reason for a diverse community. In what way is Hassan being sort of outside of reason, do you think, with his conclusions? It's like the extreme solution to what could be a compromise, right? Hassan is radicalizing a large... Uh, audience and Ethan and Jews are getting harassed because of it. Hassan doesn't care. I think that's, that's a misrepresentation of what's happening. I think you're wrong. What's extreme for one is not extreme for another. True. Extreme equals something I disagree with. Oh, geez. Hassan is not extreme. Hassan is uh, passionate and steadfast, and he's an activist at the end of the day. An entertainer, first and foremost, but he's definitely more of an activist. And Ethan has decided to be an activist in a way, and he's like making a stance. So that's kind of interesting. Discord says, I think Ethan's motivation is primarily rooted in a lot of hate, the hate he's been getting. It seems many people have the impression that he's just chronically online, but when people are doxing and going after his Teddy Fresh employees and harassing his family and employees, I think it affects him deeply. Yeah, I think without a doubt, Ethan is having like a real emotional reaction to the situation. And I do personally think it's an uneducated position he's coming from. And he's he's coming from a position that isn't understanding Hassan's. Like, I think it's very easy to underhand, understand Hassan the more you learn about him. Like, even the little bit I saw of him over the last 12 hours in, in getting ready for this video, I was like, okay, I get it. Like, I get, it. okay, chat. I love you so much. Did you not watch my stream last night? We went over this last night. I watched half of Ethan's video yesterday. You said Ethan shows his video. Ethan praising the guy he knows says all Jews should die. Unlike other people, he doesn't put a stance against anti-Semitism. I love you. A person saying all Jews should die is the same as an American soldier saying all Arabs should die. So you have to give me more than that. You have to give me more than a person saying something extreme because for every bad example Ethan used, I could give you an American who did the same shit. So I'm going to need an example that you think makes it worse than Americans or the same because the same reason we praise our U.S. soldiers is the same reason you're using to discriminate against these people. So I want to know what is unique about that position. What is unique about the position? You're acting like this is unique or horrifying. Did you not grow up in America? Did you not see the news propaganda? Are you too young? Were you too much of a baby? Maybe you are. As an 80s baby, I already watched it happen. I listen to conservatives when they talk. You should hear what people say about Arabs in close quarters. So I'm going to need some example of how this is unique to this person. It's not good. I agree with you. It's really shitty. Is it more than just shitty? Is it specific? Is there something here that should be more horrifying than how I feel about Americans? Discord said turning the Middle East to glass is definitely something Americans say. And you know what? For those of you new to my audience, I used to say that. My parents are Assyrians from Iraq. And when I was a Republican, we thought it was cool to say that the Middle East should be turned to glass. Do you guys know what that means for the kids in the audience? It means we nuke the Middle East and turn the sand into glass by mixing it with fire. I have family there. That's how deep the propaganda was in my brain. That I was justifying 
the destruction of Iraqis in the Middle East because I believed Republican bullshit, like, propaganda. So again, for those of you who don't understand, we are all born into bubbles that convince us the other people on the other side of the planet who say the same shit we say, they're bad when they say it, we're good when we say it. So I'm going to need you to sit your ass down and decide. Do you actually understand that all of us look at each other and all of us judge other people much harsher than we judge ourselves, right? And so we're just trying to humanize everybody. Hassan isn't perfect. He's got problems. He's in love with this little Houthi kid, right? Probably not a good idea, but this Houthi kid probably literally feels like he's fighting for the liberation of his country in the same way our soldiers think they're fighting for the liberation of ours. What is the actual problem in this situation? We're not accepting humans are going to human. We're not accepting we're part of the problem. We're not accepting that the problem is just that humanity is this way. This is what we are. We are growing, confused beings who work by making mistakes. And mistakes will come in the form of killing populations. This is why you must learn from your mistakes so you do not repeat them. When we say don't repeat history, we're talking about the mistakes. We're talking about the mistakes. But we don't learn from our mistakes because we don't know what the lesson was we were supposed to learn. We don't know what the lesson is we were supposed to learn. What is it? You miss the trees for the forest? Is that what Dr. K said? <laughs> you like if you if you don't if the perception is off, you're not getting the full picture. And the full picture is that if we were there and we were raised like this kid, we'd have the same conclusions. Just like when we're here, we have these conclusions. Everyone thinks they're born into the perfect bubble. Think of every religious kid that's born into the religion they, their parents were in. They're like, this is the real religion. Well, how do you know? Well, because I got picked into the right one. Everyone thinks they ended up in the right bubble. Everyone thinks they're right. And I'm saying we're all probably more wrong than we are right. And it's always wrong to wish death and destruction on other people. Always. There is never a right moment. Right? There is never a right moment to celebrate the death of other people. You might do it. You might feel vindic vindicated. You might make a joke that you wish they would see heaven or go to hell where they belong. But it is never okay. But it is very human. And we do it. All of us do it. All of us have a moment in our life where we've Felt like someone finally got what they deserved. Ooh, you really got what you deserved. Nobody gets what they deserve because nobody deserves anything. We simply exist. Wishing ill on people is the problem. And yes, Hassan sometimes appears to be celebrating the destruction of other people. I think that's bad. I think it's bad when anyone does it. Okay? So again, I am coming from this as a five perspective, not a two perspective. I have no, there, I'm not rooting for anybody. I'm simply pointing out what I'm observing. Chat says all people deserve peace. What the fuck are you on? Who do you, what is peace? What is peace? Define it for me. Go ahead, Habibi, define it for me. What do you, what do you think that means? I deserve peace. What is peace? Define it for me. Go ahead. Go ahead, define it for me. Are you serious right now? Okay, so you don't know. Habibi, please, if you're going to advocate for something in my chat, know what you're saying. Don't sit here and say, what, how, what oh, you don't even know what it is. It's the absence of war. Honey, prejudice and racism exist in peace. Rape exists in peace. If, if it's the absence of war you want, move to a place that feels like it's not in war. And if you think humans deserve it, what else do humans deserve? Peace has nothing to do with war. Peace is the war within the self, within your humanity. Peace is not the action of a person hurting another person. Peace is about the relationship and symbiosis you have with existence. If you wanted peace, you could die or you could breathe. I recommend breathing. You can find peace right now. Peace is in us. It is in you. Peace is found in the individual. Unless you're talking about, which you are, the construct of thinking you control nature itself. I want peace, no more tornadoes. Sure. You are talking about what you dream of, which is a place without people. 
There is no such thing as peace as long as there is people. The only peace you find on earth is within yourself. You cannot have peace among people. You only have the illusion of it. Name a place that is peaceful in a way which all people would agree with you. They do not struggle and peace is there. Exactly. Monkey D. Trevi. Peace is acceptance. Inner peace and outer peace are different. It only feels different. People can have peace in war, but the war is a reaction of an energy hitting another energy. That is the issue. You're doing this thing where you're like, oh, we want is peace. Okay, go ahead. Start. You start. Tell this little Houthi kid to start. Tell Hassan to start. Tell... Tell everybody to start. Let's start right now. This isn't geopolitical analysis. You're being very abstract. Welcome to a philosophy channel, my bro. <laughs> they think I do politics. This is a philosophy channel. I'm not interested in your politics because politics isn't about truth. It's about winning. So if you want to go win, go play war with somebody else. You think peace is politics? You think politics is going to bring you anything but, but war? If you want peace, get out of politics. Okay, bye-bye. Look at this person. This person's like molding, bro. Politics is about winning. What do you, why do you think they call it a race, bitch? Why do you think they call it a race? These people all in a race they don't even know they're in. And that's why they're shocked when the world ends up different than they perceived it. You think politics is about peace? My guy, when in history has politics ever been about peace? Chat says it's hard to obtain peace when greed exists, which means it's hard to obtain peace when humans exist. Humans? In nature itself, we are nature. Like, peace is very hard if you're in a town with tornadoes, y'all. Nature is, 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 have you ever seen two bears fight? There's something peaceful about the fact that they're moving in symbiosis, but also there's something very uncanny about it. Do animals have peace? Animals are us. We are animals. Like, animals have just as much peace and chaos as the other, but animals are rarely engaging in peace. Peace is in the moment, though. I've seen my animal be peaceful. I've seen Indiana Jones be peaceful. Chat says, why even talk about real world then? Why analyze conflicts? Because I'm analyzing people. And because it might save an individual today who thought maybe I should kill myself because this is too much. Don't kill yourself because the world is suffering. Give yourself peace while the world suffers. Because if everybody did that, imagine the world, huh? I can't save the world, but I can help one person who was like me who felt like killing herself under the pressure and destruction of the world, who said, instead of killing myself, I'm just going to be peaceful. And I'm going to accept that this is the world I was born into. This is the world we were born into. And the people who continue it are people who are not at peace. They're not in their joy. They have no symbiosis. They're moving out of fear and fear is the root of all evil. Evil is a construct. And so you see this person in chat who's like, this isn't useful at all. You're saying nothing. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean I'm not saying something. And that's the irony of it all. The people in the chat who are like, this is nonsense. I don't get it. This is like talking. This is like talking to a white man in America who thinks they're suffering the most. Because they're suffering so much, they can't imagine that they're literally suffering at the highest part of the hierarchy. It's like a bubble. This is what I'm saying. It's a bubble. And the bubble stops you from perceiving other people's lived experience because you can't imagine it. You don't, You. it's like, you can't put yourself in other people's shoes. Is this a Kamala Harris campaign? I already voted for her, guys. Vote. Kamala Harris. It's one step closer to gay, everyone being gay. My goal voting Kamala Harris is that everyone is a homosexual by 2050. 2050, baby. Let's go. You're in the American bubble. Ironically enough, I'm also in the Croatian bubble. You're right. I am in the American bubble. I'm in the Croatian bubble. I'm in a lot of bubbles. I'm in the gay bubble. I'm in... The woman bubble, I'm in the man bubble, I'm in a lot of bubbles. You're right. 2050 at the latest. 2050 at the latest, okay? At the latest. Every single person on earth, baby. Can we get back to you saying people don't deserve anything? Deserve is a construct of expectation. I deserve to be happy. I deserve a woman to love me. I think it's really f***ed up that women won't f*** me. I really deserve to have love. Wow, bro. Cool. What are you, an incel? The idea of deserve comes from entitlement. I feel entitled to a world that doesn't exist. I feel entitled to be happy with my life as if it comes from other people. I feel entitled that the world cater to me. Nobody is entitled to anything. That doesn't mean you can't advocate for a world that treats people better. Not because they're entitled to it, but because it's within reason. And I'm not getting mad, bro. I'm getting passionate. I'm a Middle Eastern woman. Don't come for me, right? You sound a little racist right now. Is it because I'm Middle Eastern and I talk loud? Or is it because I'm gay? Which one do you hate the most? 
I'm being highly sarcastic, by the way, in case you're like autistic, because a big portion of this audience is autistic. So they don't always get my humor. But when you do, you get it. Hey, man, I hate when people misread passion for anger. I think they're just not used to it, because to be fair, in certain cultural bubbles, anytime you raise your voice, it's it's anger. But that's not what it, that's not what it is. Right. Next topic, please. My brain is rotting. <laughs> Are we, are we rotting in chat? No, don't rot. <laughs> uh, I love seeing people struggle to under, with understanding you. Well, what a great opportunity for me to like prove how good my work is. Isn't this a great example? Like, I feel like it just proves that my theory is so good. What is this chat? She's literally saying human rights are entitlement. I said people deserve peace. And she said deserving things is a construct. What the fuck is happening? Bro, this person might have a bubble pop today. Their whole life could be better. Or it's just going to be the same. Could you imagine if this person has a bubble pop right the fuck now and realizes like, oh my God, like we're just like living on a planet. I love that. Oh, and uh, by the way, my Discord just said, bro, human rights are literally made up. I don't know if you know this. Human rights are a construct, right? They're not inherent. Did God give them to you? Who do you think gave you those human rights? They're a construct that humans made up by saying you shouldn't have them in the first place. The idea that we even have to fight for our human rights is because other humans thought about creating a construct where they took it away. You're born with human rights. People take them away. You don't deserve them. You're born with them. The fact that you think you deserve them tells me you don't realize you were born with them. Now, if you say other human beings need to understand that they're creating constructs to take away my human rights. I agree with you. And we should figure out how to under, like how to make people understand that every single one of us, right, exists in a world that would be miserable for somebody else. So how do we give people civil rights and human rights? Not because they're just humans, but because it's within reason. It's like these things matter. And they matter because I think you are more than the constructs that keep you subjugated. Everything is a contract so what should we do now everything is a construct so you should live your life to the fullest and then you should die with dignity that's what you should do that's what all of us should do we should all live our lives to the fullest and die with dignity but we die undignified because we live undignified and we exist undignified because the people who give birth to us are all traumatized and then these cycles of trauma continue and then we get into discord conversations like i see you want to do in chat i wish i could have safe conversations with people on the internet so I don't mind if you chat, but I think like chatting is probably appropriate for now because ultimately, look, you have to understand where I'm starting from and I have to understand where you're starting from. So where are you starting from? What do you think humans are doing here? How do you think we got here to be on the planet? Raiders, you said, I wish Discord was free. I would join. So you don't think content creators should be paid for their work? Ah, oh, what a construct. We're all surviving under this capitalist hellscape. All of us have to figure out how to pay our bills. All of us need to learn how to survive. All of us need to like, figure out how to live. You're just animals on a planet figuring out how to exist. There's a lot of things we would do if it was easy. It's not about being easy. It's about knowing what we want. Okay? So again, you have to decide how did you get here? Who brought you here? Some people believe in gods. Okay? Some people think they're here because of magic. Some people think they're here because they're evolved animals. You have to actually understand why are you here? And then you can tell me what construct you've built about peace around that. I think that's the hardest part for people to process. The reason people create the construct of a God and religion is because it allows them to have a foundation to move off of. They need to move forward. Okay, well, how do I move forward? Well, God tells me what to do. Okay, but what if you don't have a God? Now, why do you move forward? I do it out of harm reduction and a desire to have a peaceful life. I have no desire to hurt people. I have no desire to harm people. I don't want to restrict religious rights. I don't want to restrict your bodily agency. I don't want to restrict you at all. I want people to have the most freedom within reason to move society forward in a progressive manner. And I think everything is a construct, even this thing we call peace. Because it's an illusion and a perception of what we think that means. People think peace is God. People think peace is love. People will say peace is breathing. People will say peace is a world with no harm. Peace, what is peace? And then people will say, you know the best way to get peace? Genocide a whole country. If that's peace, I don't want it, right? Isn't that what we always get told? We had to nuke Japan so we could have peace. They were gonna hurt us. If that's peace, I don't want it. Peace is a geopolitical construct 
is about non-interference as a geopolitical construct is about non-interference. Sure. I, in that, in that bubble for sure. But you see how you're playing within that construct. I love that. I don't play that game. I think that game is limited. I think that game is limited. And I prefer playing a different game. Like I want my story to be different because the game you're playing is a good one. Someone has to do it. It's just not me. And I'm assuming you're playing to your strength. You said you're a law student. I love that. I love that. You should do that. I just don't want to do it. And I think ultimately, like, it only gets you so far and then you die. You said, I think you're conflating the philosophical definitions of peace with materialistic ones. Sure. Okay. Chess says, I disagree. I think it's fine to play in constructs. Do you think I said otherwise? Do you think I don't live in a construct? What do you think YouTube is? What do you think life is? What do you think language is? What do you think love is? What do you think communities are? Do you think I really said that I don't believe in a construct? Or am I saying we all live in constructs, which means we can pick different ones? You get to choose the story. And when you look at your life, do you know that this is what you've chosen? This is what humanity keeps picking. Chess says, in your opinion, do you think any constructs are beneficial to society? Yes, family constructs are very important. Friends are constructs. They're very important. Guys, constructs aren't bad. Yeah, I think you avoid engaging with certain constructs sometimes. I do. Why would I engage with Nazi constructs? Why would I engage with constructs that are only interested in limitation? Everybody doesn't engage in all constructs. Just because I don't want to play with you doesn't mean I'm a bad person. You're just mad I won't play with you. I don't want to play with you. I don't play your game. I don't want to hang out at your club. Your club is limited in a way that's not helpful to me or my audience. It doesn't mean it's not helpful for you and your people, right? Chat says, by the way, you keep implying I'm a white dude. I'm an Indian American guy. Just look at my username. First of all, I did not mean to imply that. I don't think I said that. I wasn't imagining you as white. I was imagining you a little bit just as a lawyer. I kept seeing you with a briefcase. But if I did say that, my bad. But also, I genuinely was just imagining a briefcase. <laughs> uh, I don't remember doing it, but you know, if I did, I'm sorry. So anyways, pick your constructs is what I'm saying. Pick the construct that gets you to the next goal that makes you happy, right? That's, that's the best power you'll have in life is that you get to pick your life story. You get to choose your anime. Chat says, I guess I see family and friends as values, but maybe values as a whole is a construct. Well, think about how you socialize with people and think about, okay, you know, the construct of like um, traffic safety, like we all stop at red lights. That's pretty good. We should do that. The idea of countries, that's not a bad construct. That works. Okay. We are... We are creating our stories. We are literally inventors. And we are inventing things based off of what we think is good. The problem is while we're inventing, we're also speaking about who's bad. But I think we have really bad judgments about who is bad and who is good. And I think we have really bad judgments because of our bias and prejudice, which we all have, all of us, me too, that keeps us short-sighted in our ability to understand people like in depth. I have a limitation, you have a limitation. And I think that ultimately is what's so confusing. We're on a planet with 8 billion people who all have very different ideas about what the best chip is, let alone what the best like, I don't know, what the best anything is. And I'm just asking people, do they recognize that? And probably not. Like that is so interesting to my brain that we're just sitting here like, oh, that's how you do that. Now, listen, I don't talk about this very often. I'll make a podcast about this. There are definitely things like there's definitely ways I judge people never to condemn, of course, because like I'm not here to condemn anybody. Just judge meaning so I know what to do next in my game because like I'm just trying to like move around you and you're trying to move around me and I'm trying to hurt as less people, least amount of people as possible. So I want to make a podcast about this. Basically, where is my line between like this is too dysfunctional to tolerate that has to either get fixed or something has to happen. And this is just dysfunctional enough that we can ignore it. Because I think it's, there's like a necessary line between, eh, it's dysfunctional, but they'll figure it out. And this is so dysfunctional, it's gonna impact everybody else in a way that's like, we can't, we have to do something. 
Of course, my solutions always involve rehabilitation, restorative justice. Like my solutions are always about helping people more than punishing. I don't believe in punishment. I don't believe in blame. I don't believe in pointing fingers. Ultimately, I believe in proper categorization and proper solutions for each context. And I think that that's something that I find fascinating. Where is the line? Because the line is different for all of us. Look at these Christians in America that are talking about, like, we need to get rid of gay marriage. Like, it's ruining the sanctity of marriage, the construct of marriage in this country. Right? Like, that's too dysfunctional. We can't, we can't deal with homophobia. Homophobia and transphobia, too dysfunctional. It just, it isn't reasonable enough and it's not healthy enough. Dysfunctional versus healthy or functional, maybe. It's just not functional enough. So we need to figure out how to like come to a compromise. I don't need to take away your religion, but you don't get to have your religion in the government. Something like that, right? Like it's just, we don't have time for this. We're losing out on way too many resources and way too many positives by denying homosexuals like opportunities to be themselves. Trans people, non-binary people, gender fluid people. It's just too valid for you to take away from society. And there's just not enough harm associated with it anymore. So- the studies that are coming out about religious trauma is, is also going to encourage us to recontextualize how religion is coming into play here. Because remember, like so many of us had to deconstruct our religions, myself included, to really even understand myself. Like what, one of the major reasons I even wanted to unalive in the first place was because I grew up religious as a queer person. And I had to deconstruct that me being gay didn't mean I was a bad person who needed to die. So I, you would talk about all humans deserve peace. I was born into chaos. Palestinians are born into chaos. Hell, even Israelis are born into chaos. We're all born into chaos. All of us. We're born into chaos because we're born into a world that decides, do I like this kid? Are they brown enough, white enough, gay enough, straight enough, tall enough, fat enough, lovely enough? Are they, are they, are they useful enough to me? All babies are born into these constructs, these perceptions. Before a baby even has a chance to be themselves, they're being judged. We're judging babies. Humans as an animal species are pretty amazing. Like if you really think about it, we're pretty fucking cool. But damn, like we are incredibly chaotic. We're so interesting. Like as a species, we're very fascinating. We're so capable. Look at me. Look at my job. Look at my full-time fucking job. This is so cool. And then at the same time, we're going to judge a baby because of its skin color. We're going to decide if a baby was cute enough to keep going. Chess says, damn, that's intense. But based off your own philosophy, people shouldn't have to like people based on their sexual orientation. I don't think you should have to like anybody for any reason. I don't need you to like me, but I need you to get out of my fucking way. I think you should deconstruct why you don't like people. But I think two perfectly wonderful people might not get along. Look, if I was meant to be friends with everybody, we would be. I don't need you to like me. I need you to get out of my fucking way, bitch. Chat says that doesn't give you the right to persecute those people, though. I don't think anyone should be persecuting anyone. I barely believe in prison systems as it is. I believe in rehabilitation. I don't think anyone should be. Um, I don't even think police officers should have the right. I think I believe in such I believe, fuck you conservatives who think you believe in freedom. I believe in freedom. I don't even think police officers should be able to pull you over um, for speeding unless it's like dangerous or unless it's like provable. I don't think police officers should have like more power over you. I don't think like they should be considered like they don't need more extra respect. You know how like resisting arrest is like, a, I don't think that should be illegal. I don't think resisting arrest should be illegal. I think if you run away from a cop, it shouldn't be illegal. I don't think they could get you for that. If you can't catch me, bitch, maybe you were never meant to have me. <laughs> Ooh, like, I just, I feel like you should get your hands off me. I pay taxes. I pay your fucking salary. Get your hands off me. Okay? Because if I can't come peacefully, it's too dangerous. If you as a police officer can't make it safe enough for people to come peacefully, even when they're guilty... You're too dangerous. Goodbye. There's nothing I hate more when people want me on the side of their fight, but their fight also involves me hating somebody else for being who they are. I don't hate anyone. I have no enemies. If me being on your side means I have to have enemies, I'm not interested. And that's the problem with the world. In order to pick sides, I now have to call somebody my enemy. Nobody is my enemy. We are simply people living on a planet. Chess says even the people you, who want you dead, why should you be my enemy just because you want to kill me? 
Why should you, why should that make you my enemy? Sounds like you have the problem, dude. Just because you have a problem doesn't mean I have a problem. In that situation where you want to kill me and you are not my enemy, I am still morally like in a better place. You are the, why are you trying to kill me? What the fuck did I do to you? Why are you doing that? If I make you my enemy, now I'm participating in your evil. Chaz says, I think many of us, me included, have very boomer parents that trust and love the police because they are the law. It's really sad because they are just so naive and want to go back to the Reagan era. You know, it's so, or Reagan way, you know, so relatable, girl. Also, chat, sorry, you mentioned Finland Saga. Fucking love it. I'm, uh, I haven't watched season two yet. Don't spoil it. Thank you. Season one's so good. Um, um, about Reagan way, you know, obviously I grew up with conservative parents, immigrant conservative parents, which you guys know, if you got a parent who immigrates to America and is like USA, they're a very specific experience, very specific bubble. And, um, it's a lovely experience. I love my parents. You know, they're my favorite homophobes, as I like to say, <laughs> three gay kids. And it wasn't enough to change their minds, you know, but the thing I love about life is that the contradictions in it say so much about ourselves. Like my parents, my whole life, I can't believe these cops are hiding in bushes to try to catch us with tickets. I can't believe these people, the government are in our business. And now we have like, what is that blue striped flag? And I'm like, what are you doing? Okay. Like, I don't think my parents currently have a blue striped flag, but I wouldn't be surprised if they got one just because they're like Trumpers. You know what I mean? It's just so interesting when people move through life and they... They live in those contradictions. But to be fair, this is a deeply held belief I have. It's a belief. I think life is all about contradiction. Tiny, tiny contradictions. That's why people are confused. Why are progressives promoting Palestine? It's not promoting. It's saying what's happening to them is wrong. The, like, it would be wrong for people to stop, start bombing America in hopes to hit all the Nazis. Yes. It would be wrong for someone to say, oh, I just want to kill the Nazis in America. So I'm going to start bombing the malls because I know Nazis love to shop for mall stuff. It's not good, is it? It's a little fucking stupid, isn't it? I think that's the wrong way to go about it. But I do think we're all living in contradictions. But I think contradictions actually go together very well. I don't think a contradiction is actually always like the negative. I think there's like positive symbiotic contradictions. And wrong and right is still a construct. It's not that killing things is wrong. We kill things every day. I eat meat. I eat meat. We're talking about when are we going to put down our cat? How sick is my cat going to get before I put her down? I live in adjacent to countries that allow assisted suicide for medically um, ill people, which I love. I, with my partner and I have discussed this, if I get so medically sick that I'm not like a person anymore, I, w I want him to take me and sign me up for one of those opportunities. I want to, I want to leave. I don't want to be here. Okay. I'm a, I don't want to do that. I want it to be ethic, ethically done, morally done and within reason and safe. So again, we're like meeting ourselves where we are, where we're at. And there's things you can do within reason. You can choose how you're going to move through the world, but it's not that we, you know, it's not that we're anti-killing, like we're willing to mow some grass, we're willing to kill a flower, we're willing to deforest. We're not anti-killing. We're anti-doing it in a way that doesn't sit well with us. And I think that's fair, but why doesn't it sit well with us? Are there better ways to do things? There are always better ways to do things. There are better ways to breathe. You know what my partner has been saying to me lately? She's like, you do not breathe well. And I was like, what? She's like, you don't know how to breathe. I was like, I know how to breathe. She goes like, you do not know how to breathe. And maybe that's true. Maybe a bitch don't know how to breathe. She's frustrated that I don't know how to use my diaphragm. But like, there are good, there are better ways to do everything. There are better ways to chew. There are better ways to swallow. There are better ways to do a lot of things. So the question is, are you willing to do the work with yourself to do things better? <gasps> Chat says, my girlfriend and I want to move to Croatia. She loves the country, isn't it? It's so great. It's a really great place. It's really great. I really love it here. They're really nice to me. As like this American girl who's in this country. They're very nice to me. Sometimes you just don't realize the world is as big as it is until you move out of the place you were born. I moved a lot when I was a kid and I moved from state to state as an adult. But until I left America, and it feels the same everywhere, if I'm going to be honest, like I've, I've, my life is like basically the same here. Of, couple, of course, it's better in some ways and worse than others, but it's mostly better. There's no hot Cheetos here. So, you know, I'm really suffering. But it's one of those things where it's an, it's a good realization of like, you know, you could just leave. You could go to different places. Paperwork is hell on earth, but you don't have to be in the place you were born. 
My parents are immigrants, so I know I don't have to stay in the place I was born. But that's like so freeing to remember that, you know? Chad says, is it hard moving to Croatia and living there? Isn't living there expensive? It depends um, where I'm married. So I married someone here. So him and I were able to use like a marriage visa and I have to renew that visa every couple years. And then I can eventually take my citizens test when I qualify. There's a whole procedure. Actually, I've been watching a lot of people like this woman in Canada came to Croatia and it took her 12 years to be a citizen. So it's one of those things where it's a little bit of a process, but so far Croatians have been very kind to us and we're getting through. Um, but yeah, like it's been an easy transition mostly, I think because people have been so good to us. And um, I think we're lucky because we're on the marriage visa, which is that, you know, are you poly too? No, fun fact, I did do poly for 10 years though in my 20s. No, I'm monogamous now. I'm in a, I always, I've been in different relationships based off what my partner and I negotiate. So this partner and I, hopefully my only partner and I until we die, though she, she could die early girl. <laughs> okay. I, we always joke who's going to die first. You know, but no, we're monogamous and we'll be monogamous until, you know, death takes us, you know, type thing. Um, girl, the hot Cheeto suffering comment made me snort. It's true. Truly suffering. <laughs> First world problems, you know, First world problems. For those of you who are new in the audience, how do you feel? Do you hate it here or do you like it? Is it weird? Does it feel weird? Is it confusing or do you get it? Of course, I don't know how I come across to the world and I watch YouTubers all day, but it's always interesting to see new people in chat. They usually can't, they usually hate it at first and then they love it. <laughs> I find that people eventually love it here. Obviously, like my stream grows all the time. So I'm like, okay, people, people eventually like it here, you know? Chess says, do you believe some people are poly in a sense that there's the only way they can do relationships, like an orientation? Ooh, I have a podcast coming up on this. Ooh. I think because we're biological creatures, we have biological changes that might change how our brains process information and attraction. So I know for myself as a human, I have deviated since I was a kid from being queer to different identities making better sense to gender attraction changing. I went from like bisexual to pansexual to like lesbian to like, I was like, what am I? And the truth is, I'm just I'm just Brittany and I'm in shifts and changes. Language is a way to communicate and signal to other people. So as long as the language between you and your partners makes sense, I think what's important is that the people that are perceiving you are getting the signal that you're safe and that you're not trying to say anything to, I'm not, I'm really just trying to live my life, watch my anime, do my stream, you know, stuff like that. But as I get older, I find that from my biological experience, I find that I'm just into people. And that's a really interesting experience and in that no matter how their body is shaped or and I, since I'm disabled as well, it's like, oh, even that element has changed. Cause you know, when you're old, when you're young, you're like, I could never marry someone disabled. And then you become disabled or you marry someone disabled and you're like, oh, even my bubble about being disabled has popped. Like, oh, like, never mind. Wait, I, I had a conception of what something was. And once I had a different perception on it, I was able to realize like, oh, okay. Like this is actually an option as well. I think I want to give people as many options as possible, as long as it coincides with their joy. I don't want you to do anything that makes you miserable. Even if it's what people are telling you to do, I want you to do the thing that genuinely makes your life better. Like chat says, what made you realize you're no longer poly? It's not that I'm no longer poly. I'm just not practicing polyamory because I don't think it's an orientation for me. It's just an option. Like I eat vegan food, but I'm not vegan. But sometimes I don't eat meat for a long time or sometimes I'm vegetarian for a while. It doesn't mean I'm vegetarian. Like I just do what I wanna do in the moment. Like life is all of these little moments and sometimes it lasts a lifetime. So polyamory for me is just a lifestyle. It's not a thing that I am. Though I will say being queer definitely has always felt like a thing that I was or being pan, being in, being same sex attracted always felt like it was more or less what I was. Chat says, I love whenever you recommend books. Do you plan on going over books you read in your 20s that helped you with your journey? You know, funny you ask that because I get really nervous asking people to 
like I get really nervous when people ask me for suggestions because I, I just feel like everything helps me in different ways. Like I read everybody. I read conservatives and progressives and I'm about to read. I have a bunch of books on Palestine in my reading list. I have a bunch of books from different bubbles in my reading list because to me, it's just like read everything, read all the time. You know what I mean? I just read all the time. So I always get nervous about that. But yeah, I started to put together the list of the 10 books in my 20s that I remember gave me shifts shifts in my life, like books I remember reading and I changed as a person. Now, again, it won't matter to you necessarily. Maybe you read the same book and you're like, what's the point of this? Because I just think we we all grow from different tools. This is myth. The reason I don't like um, movie people, no offense. The reason I don't always get along with movie people is because they have this illusion that there's truly like an objectively good film that if everybody watched this movie, it would change their life. And it's like, uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe in that. So when you recommend a movie, you're like, did it change your life? It's like, I'm not you, dude. It's not going to change my life because your experience with that movie is what you needed to change your life. But it's, I'm not you. So it feels that way when people ask me like, what book really changed your life? I need help. It's like, I girl, I, I don't know, girl. Chat says, very jealous. Reading makes me fall asleep. If you are the kind of person that also likes audiobooks, I've been re- listening to a lot of audiobooks and Spotify Premium has like a lot of audiobooks. I just read uh, Drew Follow's book called Loud, which is really great if you're in the, if you're struggling with being a pick me or if you're like in a budding like baby feminist stage, it's really good. Um, so I definitely recommend that. And that's just like on Spotify premium. You could just listen to Drew, you know? Oh, Maiden says, I just realized I've been watching Brittany for 10 years. Shout out to Maiden. God, how does a decade go by? That's what I mean. I was 25 at one point and that girl was so miserable and so unhappy and pre-therapy and pre-figuring out her life and shitty relationships, just completely a mess. And boom, 10 years later, thriving, joyful, in remission, thriving in every way possible in love. My cat's still going, you know, Indiana and I have been together for 10 years, 11 years, 10 years. She's 13, but I got her in 2014. So 10 years. Yeah. Chat says, I do wonder what my perception of you would be like now as a new viewer, but as a longtime viewer, who you are now feels so natural with who you've been on YouTube anyway, in the past. Mm. I wish I could view myself. Sometimes I meditate and try to see myself like a stranger would see me or see, see myself the way I see a stranger. And it's so hard. Sometimes I can do it. Sometimes I'll look in the mirror long enough and I can almost like see myself as if it's not me. And I'm like, oh my God. And like, sometimes I'm like, kind of like thrown back at looking at myself because it's not in that one split second. I swear it's not me. And I'm like, and then I can kind of observe my face and how I look. And it's interesting how my brain processes how I look to myself when I'm really looking at myself versus just like, oh, I'm looking at myself because I'm doing my hair. When I'm really looking at myself, like I lost in my own eyes and then I kind of zoom out and I can move perception and it's like, oh, that's my face. Like this is the body that I was given. This is like, this is like the physical boat that gets me through life, right? This is my Mary, you know? I love how in One Piece, the ships have spirits. It's like my favorite. I love that. Lee says, do you think morality is subjective or objective from a philosophy view? That's the topic of Israel-Palestine has made me think more about lately or about this lately a lot. Sorry. Oh, my God. The way I, the way I paraphrase when I read your comments, guys. Um, I think morality. I think morality is subjective. I think everything is subjective. Through the human perception, through human perception. But I think there is, my theory is, because I don't know this, there is an objective outside of our perception, outside of space and time. I do think there is. Some people view objective like they view the space, like universe, like, oh, the planets are objective because there's no sway. But planets are in bubbles. They live in ecosystems. What exists outside of that? What exists outside of that? What exists outside of that? And the thing that exists outside of it shouldn't be. I think that's why God is such an interesting idea. They say God can hold the universe in the palm of his hand. But I think God is a metaphor for that thing we might know as a species, maybe. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's a trick of the brain that there is an objective outside of that. Maybe. But 
to, to have access to it is sort of, the, it's sort of like an oxymoron. Like how could I have access outside of my own perception? But that's why meditation gives you an opportunity to be more than your thoughts. Cause I do think you're more than your thoughts. I think you're more than your actions. I think you exist outside of your action, but this is like, this is not one-on-one philosophy, right? This is like, this is like, <laughs> like, okay. But even that idea of like, you do not exist. Like if you zoom out to the universe, like we certainly aren't perce- perceivable. I can't perceive my existence. Like I can't perceive your existence. Like I know you guys exist because your usernames come up, come up on stream. And if I'm lucky, some of you, I actually know like what you look like. So I even have a physical form to put you to. But that's the thing that is so interesting to my brain. What is the thing that I could also perceive outside of those things if I didn't have the bias of my perception? But then to perceive it is to add in the bias or the prejudice or the the thing that moves you in a direction, the judgment that hits your brain so fast that you have to almost like stop it from occurring. Uh, let's see. Nikki says, when I first came across one of your videos, I really misunderstood the purpose of your channel. Now that I've been watching you for a few months, I've been more... Um, Conscious, conscientious, conscious, conscience, con, con, conscientious about perspective. Oh, I love that vibes, vibes. I think a lot of people, look, I recognize a few things. I'm one of the only female presenting people in the space who do commentary in the way that I do it. I am the only person in this space who specifically talks about her own philosophy system she's created. Like, I know that this is my hobby. Like, this is my obsession. This is my little focus. So I know that I must be so strange when people come across me because we're used to our scripts. We're used to our bubbles. And as a person that from day one just couldn't adhere to the script, I certainly wasn't going to have one on my channel that was going to be relatable to very many other channels. And so I can understand why I like come off off putting to people. I actually have had gotten some feedback from people like, oh, the way you talk is annoying. You say things so matter of fact, like, you know, everything I'm going to laugh if I do get diagnosed this fall with autism. And I'm going to start saying it's the autism ableist. (laughs) It's just the way I talk, but I genuinely don't think we have the answers. I just talk this way because I don't have a reason to be insecure about my ideas. That doesn't mean I think they're true. I just don't have any insecurity. (laughs) I just, it's, it's just a, it's just a matter of Britney's fact. It's just a matter of Britney fact. It's not a matter of fact. But yeah, I think it's the lack of the people see insecurity as humility. I have the humility. I don't have the insecurity. And also when women do it, it's like obnoxious. And when men do it, they're just leaders. Gender is fucked. We perceive gender and then we make a judgment. Everyone always says, can women and men just be treated the same? Start. You start. Go ahead. Every man that has ever criticized me on the internet for doing the same thing a man has done Go ahead. You start because there is no way you're not judging me through my gender because why else would what I'm doing make a difference if I'm doing the same thing he's doing. Maiden says one thing I admire about you is your confident vibe, to be honest. I appreciate that. I appreciate All right. Are we done with the subject matter? Should we move on? We've been here for two and a half hours. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm 